All right, welcome back. I hope you're enjoying the conference so far. Our next speaker is Hendrik Vincent Cox. He is a senior data scientist at RTL Netherlands. Please join me in welcoming him to our virtual stage. Thank you very much. So thank you. Um, uh, my name is Hendrik Vincent Copes, and I'm a senior data scientist at RTL. And today I will present about the AI song contest. Uh, and this is joint work with uh, Anna, uh, Monica, and Carrie from Google, and Ed from, uh, from ByteDance. So I wanted to discuss in this presentation, um, basically, what is the AI song contest, uh, why AI songwriting is hard, and also the ethics of AI songwriting. So this whole talk basically is uh, uh, centered around uh, this AI song contest um, that we uh, uh, started last year. And this year was the second edition. And the AI song contest is an innovative creative AI competition uh, that's inspired by the Eurovision song contest. And we ask participants to create a four minute song with the help of artificial intelligence and to describe their process in a document. So, so write a process document that basically tells us what AI did you use in, and in what way. And so this year we had uh, 38 teams from all around the world. And these teams consisted of musicians, artists, scientists, and developers. Um, so basically musicians who are interested in AI in some kind of way, um, uh, and scientists or developers who are interested in music as well. Um, and so together they, they, they created a four minute song and des described their process in the document. Um, and to um, basically decide who the winner is because it, it is a contest, um, we have a jury of AI experts, uh, AI and music experts, and uh, we have the public. So the public votes on um, whether they like the song, um, whether they would recommend it, recommend it to a friend, um, whether they like the melody, those kind of so those kind of things, and then the jury uh, looks at the process document and looks at the, the use of the AI, uh, the creative use of AI, uh, what kind of methods were used, uh, those kind of things, and together, so 50-50, uh, uh, fifty percent of the of the public vote and fifty percent of the um, AI panel vote together decides the uh, the winner um, of the of this year's of, of the edition. Um, um, so this year we had almost six thousand votes from uh, from uh, three thousand seven hundred voters. So on average, one point six song per voter, and the winning team was announced on our virtual AI and Creation Day on July sixth, um, where we had a whole day of sessions uh, surrounding AI and music, so and AI songwriting and, um, and other kinds of AI and, and, uh, and music. And the speaker, uh, the winner of this year was announced by Imogen Heap, uh, a Grammy winning um, musician who uses a lot of technology in her songwriting. All right, so why did we organize the AI song contest? So basically there are, are, are two reasons. So one is um, it's a really interesting testing ground for figuring out new ways to be creative with AI. So um, this is a testimonial of, uh, of one of the teams. And they said, the piano brought along an explosion in human creativity. And we believe that AI is the next piano and we wanna be part of making this happen. So this relates to basically technology um, uh, starting a new um, new way of being creative in music uh, and with that creating new genres or new kinds of music that weren't possible before. So here the piano is given as an example, um, but I think the electric guitar is also a really good example. Uh, it was only when the electric guitar was invented that all kinds of uh, new genres and new kinds of music making were, uh, were invented. Uh, like metal and um, rock music and all these different interesting subgenres, they were all invented with this technology of the electric guitar. And before that, it was the acoustic guitar. 
but only after the electric guitar was invented. There was basically this explosion of new genres. A second thing that's really interesting about the AI Song Contest, that it shows that, it, that AI can help in the democratization of songwriting. So um, some of the teams actually said, without AI, I could not have written a song. Um, so th there, were, there are teams in which, they, in which the members are, um, have a lot of experience with AI and machine learning, those, those kind of uh, techniques, but not with songwriting. Um, but, but using these methods for songwriting um, made it possible for them to be creative in music and uh, made it possible for them to express themselves uh, in music. Um, so really giving people the, the possibility to write music and be creative in music when they don't have that much uh, musical experience, which is really interesting. All right. And even though it's, uh, it's democratizing songwriting, it makes it easier for some people. It doesn't mean AI songwriting, songwriting is easy. It's actually um, really hard. Um, and um, I'm going to present to you three reasons why AI songwriting is hard. And these are the results from basically making a meta-analysis of the submissions from last year and looking at uh, all the process documents that the teams submitted and looking at where they ran into two problems with, uh, with their uh, AI songwriting. Um, and basically we discovered three themes. So AI is not decomposable, which is basically means you need to create separate models for a lot of different things in music. Uh, the second thing is that AI is not context aware. That means if you have a lot of different models um, to create the, the different elements of your song, it's really hard to, uh, to combine these different elements. And the third one is that AI is not directly steerable. If you have a model that's capable of generating some output, it's very hard to basically find the, the knob inside the AI to turn to create the out, to, to modify the output to whatever you want it to sound like. And for th these three aspects, I will give um, some examples with, uh, with musical examples from the submissions from last year. So the first one, AI is not decomposable. So um, a lot of the teams um, um, think they, they can start out with um, basically creating a model that is an end-to-end -end model, which basically means that um, at the end, they have a model where they can just push a button and a complete song comes out. And this is uh, very hard, um, not only because it's, it's, a, it's a very hard, hard and very high dimensional problem that's very hard to capture in, in an AI model, um, um, but also because when you have the output, it's really hard to change something in it. So what, what if you have a model and you can create a complete song but you want to change a small thing in the in the song, a small thing that that, that you that you don't like the sound of, for example, and it's very hard to do that. Um, so, um, although teams found out that this is very hard to do, they did use it as a really interesting um, um, uh, interesting way in their songwriting process. So, this is an example of uh, uh, DataBots and uh, Portrait XO from last year. And they wrote the song, I'll Marry You, Punk Come. And what they did is they, they in the beginning, they tried to generate a song uh, for, from a model that was, that was trained on um, basically historic data set of Eurovision Song Contest songs. And they tried it to generate a complete song using that model. And that failed. But they did uh, generate um, um, music in which they uh, they heard a voice singing and they tried to interpret the voice and try to interpret the lyrics, which gave them inspiration and the, uh, basically the inspiration for their narrative of their song and the melodies um, and other aspects uh, of their song. So in the end, they used the output as inspiration, but basically used only parts of it and basically built an entire song um, around it. Uh, and this is a musical example of, uh, of, of this song. 
in which the low, if you listen to it, the low voice uh, is the part that's generated. And the high voice is the voice from uh, the artist you see here on the left, who's singing along with the AI generated material. So really interesting that the although the models failed or their their attempt failed, it really it, it did give them inspiration to create um, um, a really interesting song that was actually um, the top pick of the AI panel from last year. Um, so this decomposition of of the de decomposing of uh, of these um, um, models uh, usually means that they have different models for different song components. And on the right here, you see an overview of um, uh, which uh, song components um, uh, teams used or, or tried to solve. And if they used AI or some human, uh, if they used human input or some AI input. Um, so commonly, so this is uh, the, the, the figure on the right is sort of sorted by um, most frequent uh, use or the, the most um, 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 what is what is the most uh, AI content of these different song components? So most teams used uh, used uh, models for lyrics and melody, which you see here on the top. Um, so for lyrics, these are usually GPT two models uh, that are capable of generating um, text that were trained on, uh, on on lyrics data sets. And also often melody was, uh, uh, was generated with AI. And then if you go lower, if you go to the bottom, you see um, things that are, are um, less often generated with AI. So uh, harmony, percussion, structure, arrangement. And then those things are progressively harder to do with AI, like vocal synthesis, for example, or instrument synthesis. Commonly, what what uh, what the teams did is they generate a lot of material for these different um, um, uh, song components, and then um, cherry pick the from the output and manually stitch uh, output together to basically create a song. Um, which brings us to our um, uh, next point: is that um, is that um, if you have all these different song components and this output from all these models, um, it's very hard to stick them together using AI. So um, if you, have, for example, have a model that's capable of generating lyrics, um, and it's capable of generating a lot of lyrics, and you also have melodies, for example, from a different model, how do you make sure those, those fit together? Yeah, because most often they don't fit together at all. The lyrics might be interesting and the melodies might be interesting, but the combination is often, um, often doesn't really work together. Um, and again, here's an example of a team that found a really interesting solution to this problem. So this is Uncanny Valley with their song, Beautiful the World. Um, these, uh, they were the winners of last year's AI song contest. And what they did is they used uh, stress patterns um, to match the lyrics uh, and the melody algorithmically. So they, they looked at uh, the stress patterns of the, the, the lyrics they generated. Um, so basically in the, in, in the lyrics, looked at where the stress patterns are and then look at, see, looking at those stress patterns and seeing which melodies fit with those stress patterns. So um, for example, they would, uh, they would generate a lot of lyrics and one of them was, the world is beautiful, the world. Another one is welcome home, oh, welcome home, oh, oh, oh welcome home. And they um, um, looked at the stress patterns of these sentences and tried to use that as kind of like a retrieval problem for their um, uh, me generated melody data set. And here's, some, here's an example of how they, um, what the eventual melody sounded like combined with the lyrics for a uh, beautiful world. Zogi is beautiful the world. And for welcome home, it sounds like this. Welcome home, oh, welcome home, oh, welcome home. 
So um, combined in a song, it um, it sounds like this. So this is uh, the the eventual produced version of the song where these uh, uh, um, these mu musical parts come together. Um, another problem that we found is that AI is not directly steered. So, um, like I said, when you have output from a model, um, or when you have a model that generates some uh, some output that you're happy with, um, how do you change the output in in such a way that you can create variations, for example? Um, often in a song you have repeating patterns, so you have a chorus that repeats uh, somewhere uh, further on in the song. Um, and often this this uh, this repetition is not one to one. This there are slight variations to the melody or to the rhythm, those kind of things. Um, but what if you have a the output of the model is just what it is, right? So if you have a model, you create the output, you cannot really change anything about it using that model. Um, but this is often this is a, a a problem that you often find in music that you want to basically reuse the same part, but in a slightly different way. So one of the teams, for example, they, they wanted to repeat the chorus, but they wanted to make it sound darker and also have a sort of like a Bach cadence. Um, and again, this is the, the Databots and Portrait XO submission from, from last year. They had a chorus in the beginning, uh, in the first half of their song um, that they wanted to tweak and create a variation of, and it sounded like this. So what they wanted to do, they wanted to take this rave part and create a sort of like a, a Bach like cadence, which is uh, sort of like a classical or um, um, uh, yeah, classically sounding um, part of the harmony, uh, basically to create sort of like a, a weird uh, version of this first chorus. But they couldn't go into the, the, to the original model and, and tweak, the, uh, tweak the output to, ma to make it sound like whatever they want, because this Bach-like cadence is not, was not part of the model. Um, so what they did is they took the output and basically used three models to eventually um, achieve what they wanted to achieve. So the way they solve this, so AI is not directly steerable, the way teams solve this is basically create an ensemble of more models to eventually get the output that you want. It's very cumbersome, but it's the, the problem of, of the AI models not being directly steerable. All right, um, in the last couple of slides, I wanted to discuss um, the ethics of songwriting. So in, in the process document that we asked uh, the teams to write, we also uh, asked a couple of questions about the ethics of their submission or the ethical problems that they might uh, see around their submission. And one of them is, uh, was uh, about ownership. Uh, and the question was basically, um, your submission, basically, who is the owner of, of that? And they were, it was a free form question. They could answer uh, um, in, in a free form. Uh, and we synthesized those answers uh, here in these, in these uh, figures. So on the left, you see a, um, a pie graph of answers of um, if they, um, basically how they discuss the ownership or the perceived ownership of their submission in their document. So five teams didn't discuss uh, this at all. There were four teams who said they were the sole owners of their submission. And there were uh, five teams who said there was some kind of ownership. Uh, two of them said there was no split and three of them said there is uh, some joint ownership. Um, and, but they are the majority uh, owners of this submission. Um, 
Uh, and when they um, um, discuss this ownership, um, it quite often you see here on the right is that they mention the developers or the AI system as being part of uh, the owners of their submission, which is really interesting and kind of strange. Um, um, I guess a sort of analogy would be that you would say that Fender, so the, the, the manufacturer of, of guitars, um, has uh, some ownership in the songs that are written on that guitar. In the same way here, uh, teams say that developers of the AI systems are, are, are part owner of their, of their song, uh, which is a, a really interesting idea, I think. Um, Another thing is that um, uh, we asked them uh, uh, if they could comment on the data use and copyright uh, um, or if they give credit to the authors of the training data. Often when, they, when teams create a, a model, this has to be trained on a lot of data. And uh, commonly this data um, um, has copyright uh, associated to it. This is copyrighted material. So the question here is that if you create a model trained on this data, is the output also, um, is it part of that same copyright? Um, uh, it, does it have the same owners as the, as the authors of the training data? Um, so um, majority of the teams didn't, uh, uh, didn't comment on this. Um, uh, and the ones that did, um, they, uh, they gave either credit in their process document to in the sense that they acknowledge where the data was coming from and would also say that the, the, um, the authors of the training data also have a stake in the ownership of the song. Um, and then there's a, another question uh, that's um, um, visualized in the pie graph on the right, is that, um, that we, asked the, we asked the teams if they checked for duplicated material. So it basically means that if you train a model on musical material and you generate some output, um, uh, did the teams check if the output um, didn't match the input, basically? So, and if it does, it means that some copyrighted material, that you generated some copyrighted material that was part of the input training data. So a majority of the teams didn't comment on it. Um, uh, there were a couple of teams who checked for duplicated material, uh, uh, two of them, um, and only and one of them, uh, they considered it, but didn't check. So with the two of them that checked for duplicated material, they had some really interesting ways of um, looking at melodies, for example, and basically check for each output uh, generated melody, if parts of those of that melody um, appeared in the input material. And if it did, they would discard it. And then they would just move on to the next one and see if that one, if first of all, if, if it was a good melody, but secondly, also, if it wasn't uh, part of the input material. Um, the problem with this, with, with all of these uh, um, uh, issues here is that there's a lot of gray area in the um, in surrounding the uh, legal issues surrounding uh, AI songwriting. Uh, I'm not a legal expert, but, uh, uh, but these are questions for which are not uh, for which there aren't really good answers, um, especially when you're dealing with an international um, context, uh, contest like this, like the AI Song Contest, where also these issues might differ all over the world in different, um, in different areas. Um, so basically these three aspects that I wanted to highlight that we learned from, from, uh, from the AI Song Contest and the submissions, um, I wanted to mention that uh, I think that these apply to other creative AI uh, co content as well, like image and video creation. Um, so I'm a, a data scientist at RTL Netherlands, and I work on, um, on video generation, for example, automatically generating um, a promo material, so trailers um, from videos, for example. And these same kind of problems uh, arise there as well. All right. Thank you very much. This is all I wanted to tell you. Wow, thank you so much. That was incredible and very insightful and very interesting for us to hear these different clips of AI talk. 
with AI songs. <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing with us today. For the audience, it's time for you to make your way to your next session. Along the way, make sure you accept your connection request and take some time to check out our amazing exhibits. Thanks so much, and we'll see you around.